with regards to uh, starting off things with this committee. As we can see, it could be as broad as Ben Hur, um, but I do see a result coming from the discussions that we have and, um, and from the passion that I can see around our table with regards to uh, good outcomes for our community. Righto. My apologies, bear with me. We're going to move to 7.2, um, age-friendly approach. We're going to have an update from staff. Um, just giving a heads up that uh, Mr. Jefferson's uh, in the room. Mr. Jefferson's in the building uh, with regards to um, an update uh, on our infrastructure with regards to the flooding that's perhaps happening up north. Just a bit of a chat. So we might just slip in, in after 7.2. Would be much appreciated. Kia ora everyone, uh, it's lovely to be here in your first meeting. So we're just going to be giving you a very brief update on uh, the age-friendly uh, strategy that is well under development and also the social investment fund for Otaki. Yep. Thank you. Um, oh. As many of you will know, the team has had uh, the development of an age-friendly approach underway for some time, and we're very delighted to be coming to the end of that process. Uh, the main thing that we're wanting to put onto your radar today is that as we are coming up to the end of that process, that the, the actual strategy will be coming to you guys uh, to uh, agree upon before it goes up to the Strategy Operations and Finance Committee for approval. Um, so we just thought we would just touch on a bit of a brief kind of background and context for this work before we get to that stage. Um, so why would we be looking at an age-friendly approach for Carpeti? Uh, age-friendly community is a place where you can stay connected, healthy and active and respective, respected whatever your age. Uh, this is particularly important for the Kapiti uh, district. There is a higher proportion of older people within the community and making sure that the community is safe and appropriate and accessible for our older people means that really it is safe and accessible for everybody. Where we're at is that uh, we have completed extensive community engagement over a number of years. Uh, this includes um, engagement with uh, particular groups. Uh, we have done a Kaumatawa engagement over years. We've also been engaging with the Older Persons Council, uh, a reference group also. Uh, we have uh, engaged with an immigrant uh, community group uh, in retirement uh, villages. So there's, there's a wide representation that have had the opportunity to feed their voice into the development of this strategy. And I think uh, once, once we're able to present it to you, you'll be able to see that there's quite quite a, a united voice within the community around the priorities of our older people, which is great to see. Um, we're at the stage now where we're talking internally to some of our uh, internal teams within the council, and then we will be able to be presenting it to SLT and to you all. So you know when you can expect to see it, uh, as this is our timeline behind us. So we'll be coming back to the subcommittee on the 16th of March, um, and then for adoption on the 6th of April. After that very brief update, is there any questions or? Um, from my perspective, uh, having the older persons counts, or the older persons portfolio, or our seniors portfolio last year, uh, great to see this work. I know it's been hugely disrupted by COVID, um, so really fantastic to see this coming to fruition. I just want to point out that age friendly um, communities is an international um, benchmark, so it's fantastic seeing that incorporated into the refresh of this um, of this policy. And look, my view is very simple. It's what is good for our mature community is also good for many other sectors as well. And I look at uh, a lot of people that would fall into that mature community. Um, well, we won't go there. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I didn't, didn't say anything, uh, uh, but now you brought it up, Nigel. But um, 
Um, and I just also wanted to comment that um, I got to meet the advisory group uh, when they first started, and that's quite. That was a very, very well put together group. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing um, what that comes through with that. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, here we go. Kim, can I start off with you? Oh, that's me. Um, yeah, just wondering if you're um, talking to, we're doing an age-friendly on the EDKB, the economic development, so is that involved in that at all? Yes, definitely. So there, there's spaces where they kind of merge. They, are, they have different focuses uh, overall, but we are definitely talking to the economic development team uh, around it also. You bring up a good point, Kim, with regards to the economic development. I think our board, they're involved in already a lot of things. We need to make sure that um, we do keep abreast of them. I will be meeting uh, with Nigel on a fairly regular basis just to make sure that we're all linked up as well. But thank you for bringing that up. Um, Kathy? Thank you, um, and thank you very much, and look forward to the 6th of April when the, um, hopefully it's, it's adopted. But I just wanted to comment, and I really like the first line, learn the wisdom of your elders. Mm -hmm. so I, <laughs> I was going to say, sometimes you need to be older to be wise, but anyway, that's just me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, now, Nigel, nice to have aspirations, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm just referring to how you're youthful, you know, your youthfulness. Right, right. Um, sorry, um, to Kathy, that's Lawrence. Can I just ask a question on the timeline here? Um, we've got a briefing after it's come to our subcommittee. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. Um, what is the subcommittee going to be doing if the briefing's not till after it? Are, are we going to be do, able to do a recommendation to the strategy, operations and finance? Just um, timeline question. So I'll take a look at the timing there and um, just make sure that we haven't got ourselves confused. What we had talked about was um, uh, actually a briefing to council um, to update all councillors and um, elected members in more detail than what you've had today about the the, the process and the work over many years to get us to the point where we then have a draft strategy and action plan to start putting to you through the decision-making process. So um, uh, what I think that probably will need to look like is a, a process briefing for the whole council before the strategy itself and action plan then comes to this committee for review and recommendation to then go to SOF. So we'll need to take a look at those dates. You're right, the, or the order of those things is, is not entirely going to work. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, look, I dare say, and I take your point, Lawrence, because I was a little bit concerned about that, that as well. And that's part of, I guess, the starting process of this committee. There'll be things that are already in process with Council that we're just picking up on the tail end that do need to be signed off. Um, as such, a lot of work has already been done in those spaces. I think, you know, in the ideal world, we would have had a briefing, maybe two or three briefings through this whole process over the last year and a half. Um, as such, which have come to council um, as such as well. So I guess this will be one of those sort of bit of a housekeeping situations of just tidying some, up, something up on the tail end. Nigel. Yeah, so um, with all of these things, uh, funding is important. So um, Te Tare Komatua, is the Office of Seniors, I'm sure you're working with them, um, how much funding is, because presumably what you're going to present is just that we shouldn't be really nice to old people, uh, but more than that. So, <laughs> anyway, um, leaving that. See, they interrupt these young people, interrupt old people. That's the problem that we have. Um, so, if you've, presumably it's a work program, right? And then there's, so there'll be money attached to that, whether it's widening of footpaths or whatever it happens to be. So, um, implications for the annual plan um, and long-term plan. So again, it's coming back to timing about what can get inside um, that space and how much money is involved. And again, back to the Office for Seniors about um, what what other funding is available. And we are a um, we're a bit of a special district in that regard because of the just the demographic. Um, so yeah, it's around that around that time. I can respond to that. Uh, we have been working with the Office of Seniors throughout this project, and they have um, they have provided funding to date. Some is it in the order of fifteen thousand um, dollars? In terms of 
uh, how to fund the implementation of the strategy and its action plan. Uh, obviously, uh, the Council is not the only organisation um, that has a role in creating an age-friendly um, space here in Kapiti, so therefore our expectation would never be that Council is the sole funder of the actions that are included in the implementation plan. That said, some of the actions will need to be delivered by Council, and should there be any issues around funding within existing work programs, that would be explored through the long-term plan process. In terms of the upcoming annual plan process, we um, had not intended to seek additional funding, um, given some of the challenges that are facing the council, that the council is facing in terms of, of that annual plan, and to um, manage the pace of, of implementation um, to match existing budgets. Uh, that said, in terms of the better off funding um, and where that might land, there is provision for implementation of the age-friendly um, uh, strategy within the suite of activities that we put up as part of our bid to the better off funding. You shouldn't talk about that, Nigel. You know, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I just wanted to add to that as well. We have an older person's council um, with regards to that potentially moving into a panel um, within this committee as well. So um, it won't be a case of the... Um, uh, the policy just being let to float. Um, there will be um, a group there that will uh, potentially push this along as well. Um, I'd like to see a bit of oversight of this, um, the, the settling in of this policy amongst that group and it uh, coming back through this table as well on how we can perhaps help. And that comes back potentially to that advocacy role as well. One of the things I was going to mention before uh, was around housing. My personal view, we get housing right, that solves all sorts of issues. Um, and uh, we're on the way of that. We've got uh, something that will be coming back through this, I think, in the Ford Work Program, more than likely, as our community land trust um, as such, but there may be other areas in the housing that we can get involved in as well, but we are moving in those spaces. But I think housing, we get, you know, we put that time and effort into housing, uh, and a lot of other things start falling into place um, as such. There's never a silver bullet that's going to um, sort all our problems out, but um, that would be a very, very, very uh, lofty um, goal, I dare say. Johnny. Yeah, thank you. Um, through you, Mr Chair, look, I'm, I mean, we talk about this age-friendly approach and there seems to always be an emphasis on the elderly and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, through this um, age-friendly, which is all ages, what has been done? I mean, we've got a lot of young families up here and children and stuff like that, so um, I'd just like to know what's been done in that space as far as this age-friendly approach. One of the... Um, one of the um uh, outcomes, if you like, from an age-friendly strategy is basically what is good for a mature community is also good for many sectors, you know, um, and say for argument's sake, footpaths, you know, we, uh, if, um, we, if there's uh, requirements in an age-friendly strategy around footpaths, say for argument's sake, there's a lot of other benefits uh, for, for uh, people using those, uh, those. It's the same with amenities, it's the same with um, potentially housing, you know, um, or even retirement villages or um, housing projects that are done. Is there provision in our um, in our consenting processes for people uh, for our for our uh, mature people? But then that captures people, potentially people with disability uh, and people with other challenges as well. I don't know if there is anything specific in legislation. I don't know if there is, but um, there's all sorts of areas that can pick up on. But I do take your point with regards to um, where is that middle? Where, where there's, there are other sectors of our community as well that. Um, are we focusing too much on one versus another? I'd like to think that there's lots of overlap, if you like, with regards to this strategy in particular. Would anyone else care to comment on this as such? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, James, I'm sorry, um, we have the same um, council staff presenting the next point as well, if that's all right. So we're moving to 7.3 of, yep, yep uh, with regards to Otaki's social investment. 
So we're just wanting to take a moment to, to uh, just to give you an update on the Autaki social investment. Um, I'm not sure uh, how many people know in detail much about the background to the Council's social investment program, but it is a year-on-year -year model of funding that we are now in our second round of, and that is for the district-wide funding. Uh, the first three years of funding finished up in 2021, and all the new contracts for the district-wide funding have been signed at the end of last year. What, uh, in addition to the district-wide funding, um, in the last long-term plan, there was provision of $50,000 per year to go to activity specifically for the Ōtaki community. And what we, what the intention was when we last reported to council on it was we were going to be building on some research that was being done in the community around the need uh, within Ōtaki and how to best stress inequity in Ōtaki. Unfortunately, that research that we were going to build upon has been delayed, and so we're in a position now where we are going to have to be developing uh, a piece of work to determine what the inequity is in Ōtaki to best position the 50000 dollars for positive social impacts within the community. Um, we were just wanting to put that on your radar because we know in the last council update that you would have had about it, we were planning a slightly different approach. Mm -hmm. The purpose of social investment is uh, to work with community organisations to deliver programs and activities that provide social positive impact for the community. Uh, for the district-wide funding, the current priorities for the funding are connected communities, safer communities and the capable sector. Um, and uh, all the district-wide funding it all fell within those three categories. But what we're hoping to do is uh, to ensure we're addressing the inequity in Ōtaki is develop an uh, Ōtaki-specific priority to ensure that we are, are addressing that. Um, what we are imagining at the moment is that we will do, the team will do this piece of work and we will be able to brief you along our process of de developing that and getting to that priority to enable a decision to be made prior to the end of this financial year so we're able to open up the funding stream for Ōtaki in the next financial year to ensure that we're getting that money out to the community in the way that we had initially anticipated. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from anyone around this? Simon. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm just new to the um, Otaki Community Board, and I was just wondering how are we going to be involved in this research and, and feedback, and how this is going to be appropriated? Um, I feel that there's a number of community members, especially um, our Otaki College principal, who's said, you know, this is, is kind of like just a... Mm -hmm. He mentions a bit of a, a token gesture because there's a whole lot more needed. And um, I think uh, if we could spend it wisely, and uh, that'd be really good, but also understanding how we can and getting the right engagement with mm. everyone would be great. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. And I do think it is one of those things as a team we are going to have to build how we do that. And I'd be really happy to work alongside the community board and how we do that. Uh, the team has a relationship with Andy already, so I would well imagine in any uh, community kind of consultation that we do that he would be a part of that. Um, but I think that's great to uh, raise now and we'll certainly keep it in mind as we develop it. Thank you. Janice, you're looking to add to that as well? Oh, just to um, reinforce what Marie said, absolutely um, having some time with the community board to understand what the board is seeing and what it believes the needs within the community are will be a part of our process. Along with a number of other groups, the, um, our, the intent behind uh, the initial decision to, to, to look at where this piece of research that another community organisation was completing in Ōtaki, where that would go and what that would say, um, and then use that as an input, was... Um, well, we took that decision to try and avoid duplication, to try and avoid some of the situations we've heard about today. Very busy people um, under pressure in social and community sector organisations, you know, getting pulled into yet more meetings so that the council can understand what they think about some stuff that another organisation was just asking them about last week. 
Um, so although that specific piece of research has not um, been completed in a time frame that enables us to sort of rely on that for, um, for setting or proposing priorities for this piece of work, there are a number of other inputs that already exist. Um, we, there is plenty of data as well as on the ground um, feedback from people working in the sector in Ōtaki on a daily basis that will help us shape this work. So I just want to reassure you that we're not talking about yet another bespoke piece of, of research to try and guide this. It'll be tapping into what we already know. And, and what Marie and Emma tell me um, that they're hearing in Ōtaki from people that are working on the ground um, are that you know the priorities that, that people see are around, continue to be around young people, around vulnerable people, and particularly, and particularly vulnerable um, elderly and vulnerable young people. Um, you've heard today people describing stories of other vulnerabilities within Ōtaki, whether it's the food bank example that Councillor Kofid highlighted. So um, uh, in terms of the suggestion that uh, a dedicated fund for Ōtaki of only $50,000 per annum is, um, is, you know, is essentially um, a, a token. Um, my counter to that would be you've also heard today from the Deputy Mayor that there are organisations desperate to deliver outcomes for their, for their community but under significant pressure to be able to do so. And in my opinion, an additional $50,000 worth of funding directed at social impact in Ōtaki will be um, welcomed and is much needed. Agreed. Thank you very much for that. Um, the Altaki Community Board uh, had an informal meeting yesterday between us and uh, we are looking at communicating, um, you know, finding mechanisms of communicating very well so we don't have that double up. And so that early engagement with us would be great because what we would like to do is just make sure that one person covers certain areas rather than doubling up or tripling up and uh, taking up a lot of our time. I'll work with Chris um, as the GM supporting your board to make sure that we make that a priority. Perfect, thank you. Could I ask um, Simon uh, about the relationship with um, Nahapu um, up, up there as well? I mean, I know there is... Oh, well, I'll let perhaps Kim comment on that. Yes, please. Um. Kim? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, Cam Shelley as well as Shelley and Ngahapu um, sat down at the end of last year and we're going to try and have regular meetings have so we can get an Ōtaki vision kind of going so we so that we all know what each other's doing and we all know where that... So it's part of that whole collaboration that we're talking about um, so we can tap into our separate areas and bring that all together. And we're also working on looking at um, a wider picture, which we've been thinking about for a while, is the Ōtaki vision. What do we want in our town as opposed to what do other people want? Yeah. Um, that's a huge piece of work. Um, but we learned last year that there's no point coming to these tables and these forums all separately when we all live in the same town. We all want the same things um, and we can all tap into the same same kind of services but with different areas and we've all got those contacts so we're kind of making it a priority to come together outside of this forum so we can bring that together here. That's absolutely fantastic to hear Kim. Well, from my perspective how I see community boards uh, they're our out facing our out facing part if you like that are very 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 close to the rock face as such and um, you know having that relationship that they can then feed into council means you're bringing our community's wants and needs to the table. As such, we as councillors can be somewhat divorced from that because of our roles. I see our community boards being that, the representatives of our community. Um, a bit like, I guess, a panel in that space as well, for want of a better comparison. One other thing, or two other things I would comment on, this is social, uh, the Social Investment Fund actually had quite a bit of funding heading up that way, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, there's 330 thousand dollars in the whole fund per annum, uh, and a good chunk of that did head up north, um, which was great. I know another chunk was taken up through um, uh, phase two, but that was district-wide as well in its approach. Uh, there was also, um, through that last annual plan, that additional funding, um, and I guess that really ties into um, Ōtaki uh, from that regional perspective, now being given you know, one, of the, one of the seven priority projects up there. Um, there seems to be a lot of things happening up that way, or a lot of things coming together, uh, which we need to capitalise on. Um, as such, hence, you know, these sorts of forums are fantastic for making sure that we're all on the same page. But there, uh, I don't think it was a sort of little handout to sort of keep Old Tacky happy, happy as such. 
um, your your ward councillor at the time was very um, uh, was was uh, I, I guess fought well with regards to uh, bringing some extra funding in. We got some additional funding for youth um, with regards to a space for youth and um, the social sustainability was specifically some extra funding put aside specifically for Old Tacky um, with regards to helping them uh, move forward as well. Um, do I have anyone else? Ah, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, just in regard to the token gesture thing, um, yeah, one person's token gesture can very often be another group's lifeline and I think the, um, one of the key things with these things in terms of whether or not you're getting value for money in, in terms of in, a social investment um, is, is monitoring. So what's it, that you're having a process for monitoring and I think working with Nahapu, working with the community board because if you are funding this, if this is $50,000, if it works, then it's a brilliant opportunity to expand it. You just keep expanding it until it stops working, right? So, um, I think it's I think it's really worthwhile. But uh, what again, with so many of these things, the monitoring I think is really important. So if there's a good process for that and a report back process, um, then yeah, the potential to grow it is is great. Comment. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, Simon, I have your name down here. Right, yes, um, thank you, Mr Chair, and look, appreciate um, every gesture is, is, is most welcome. Um, one of the things that I have found um, in my introduction to the community board is that there seems to be lots of fundings in lots of different places going to lots of areas. It would be really nice to have an overview of what there is. Uh, one of the discussions we've had uh, in the community board is that um, you know the rev revocation process, let's say, for an example, is that um, Waka Katahi is actually putting a lot of funding into that revocation process. It would be nice to actually understand how we can also use or have input into their plans from a social perspective as well. Things like having you know, a, a set place for markets where, where the community can gather as well. What are we going to use you know, uh, the old railway building for, which is you know, dangerously becoming derelict? And, and what are all these other areas of funding which we are getting, we can actually see if we can cross over and getting a better reach for it and so we can you know utilize um you know what what little funds we do get better um take it on board simon feel free um from a staffing perspective officer perspective correct me if i'm wrong um i guess part of the uh, challenge in that space is that um, what kotahi have engaged they have um where there's been consultation processes etc but a long time ago uh, and um, due to the length of time that um, it takes to complete these projects, one could all potentially argue that um, there's that consultation now out of date with regards to the current requirements uh, that are there. But, um, but you know, funds were given to elevate Oltaki with regards to um, developing um, after the road's been diverted. I do think it's important though, and um, council officers are very good at this, is ensuring that we get um, as much bang for our buck uh, in that process, hence why we have cycleways attached to the um, expressways, et cetera. Um, but it's important to keep uh, on top of that. Uh, and the reason I say that is I just look at what's happened in Waikanae with regards to the uh, revocation process and how that's impacted on the shops and all the um, fencing that's been up. Uh, and I know um, council staff have been very diligent in keeping on top of Waka Kotahi with regards to trying to make that as easy as possible, but one could say that hasn't necessarily been reflected in the outcome um, as such. Again, that's maybe something that community boards uh, can keep a pretty good handle on uh, and uh, be working with council officers um, with regards to ensuring that uh, there's minimal disruption um, as such um, as well. But, um, yeah. That is our plan. I just use that revocation as an example. Oh, that's a good example. Uh, and, and, and just, you know, if there are other, all these funds which people are talking about, which I'm not necessarily aware of at the moment, it would be nice to have a kind of like an understanding of where they are, what they are, how they're being applied, to whom, so we can try and get some coordination between it all. Mapping um, as such. That'd be great. Lawrence, could I ask, is there any sort of um, social services type mapping exercises happening within um, what you guys are doing? Uh, very good question. Um, in our meeting last week, where we spoke with some of the sector leaders, um, 
that was probably top of our, well, outside of talking about the actual issues that our sector is facing that I mentioned before, um, the second piece that sat under that was the mapping um, of what is happening. Because one of the things that we're very aware of that showed up in phase one of the capital sector was that there has been no comprehensive research done mm -hmm. across the Kapiti district of our social and community sector at all, ever. Um, and our first uh, stab at that in phase one was a very limited resourced one. So that's an ongoing conversation that probably needs to have uh, with our connect, kept connected communities team on, on how that works to ensure that we are getting the best bang for buck across our investment um, as a sector. We, we know there are some gaps, um, but we also know that there's some people that are doing a lot of work uh, that are siloed, as Kim mentioned before, and that happens across our district on a regular basis. Um, and we've, yeah, we're very conscious that that is an area of work that needs to to happen. Could I ask, in an open manner, um, with regards to funding for um, a piece of work like that, would there be an expectation that that would be council funded, or is that something that should be people potentially working with a central government agency to joint fund or even completely fund? Those are probably some conversations. We we want to, under the capability program and the funding we have received, to start a process around that. I don't think we've got enough funding to ensure that we could do that effectively and not waste money, because it is a huge piece of work. Um, and we don't necessarily have the expertise to be able to do that well. But what we have said is that if we can get the key stakeholders in the room, we can probably identify the majority, 90% of what is happening across our district pretty quickly. Um, and with some conversations beyond that, maybe able to fill the other 10% in. But to bring some comprehensive work, work and, and, and reports that are able to hold water and we can use, like what we've done with the housing strategy, where we've created a whole bunch of information and data that then enables funding to be sought from central government, we'll need some robust research and behind it, not just conversations and identification of this So, in regards to everything we've talked about this morning, and I'd just be interested in a, in a steer from the table here, would we consider that fairly high priority with regards to um, a piece of work that would benefit our district? I appreciate that there, um, I'm not saying that we will commit to it, um, but do we consider that a priority as part of this um, committee's actions, should we say? I just, you know, generally on the table, do I get nods, nose, 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 Well, we think it is. <laughs> From the social and community sector, we think it's a significant and important piece of work. Yeah. Agreed. Fantastic. Yeah, sorry. I've got you, I've got you on your name down here, Simon. Just endorsing that. Um, through the uh, strategy sessions and the induction process we had, you know, meeting with um, a lot of the, the, the council staff, and there were so many, as you say, siloed areas, and just every every conversation was five or ten different groups were mentioned, which I had no idea about. And my suggestion was to actually, um, and where Lawrence broached on that, was actually um, having a landscape map who, who are all the organisations out there? What are their um, Stop areas of scope and, and focus? Um, because, and that's what we're starting to do uh, with the Old Taki Community Board as well, say, right, who are our organisations around us? A lot of our um, documentation is out of date. Some organisations don't exist. New ones have come into play. And so if we don't take stock of our organisations and consider them as assets and how we link them up and, and utilise them, then I don't think we can really make decisions in, at this policy level um, to, to, to help everyone uh, efficiently. Um, thank you. Um, Simon, again, Lawrence, sorry, I pose another question to you. In round one of your social investment funding, uh, sorry, I stand corrected, in round one of the social investment funding that um, Volunteer Carpet Impact Trust had uh, was part of a mapping exercise, if I remember correctly, which is a web-based one. How did that go? So we, uh, we created a snapshot um, which was literally just a photo in time of what we were able to get from uh, from what we knew from surveys that we put out was not a comprehensive piece of work. But what we have developed is an online resource called ourcarpetycommunity.org. Um, that's the website address, ourcarpetycommunity.org, all one word, lowercase. Um, 
which is a searchable database of current existing uh, social and community agencies and organisations that we are aware of and have, have identified. That includes a brief um, overview of their, their primary work and business as usual. Um, we're very conscious that that is an, and is, this is part of phase two, is the ongoing development of that website and using uh, and making it available. We are aware that there are other people that have been working on similar things, and so there's, um, there's a bit of a, uh, a need for coordination again, so we're not doubling up on resources and creating something that is also in existence elsewhere. We're not trying to do an online database, that's really important to understand. Um, it is a, uh, a place where you can land um, that gives you a starting point for who you could speak to right. about the sector and what is happening. Okay. Sort of our vision for our sector is to build a sector where one door opens every door. Yep. Well, it's a good starting point um, and maybe something that can be looking, looked at to build on um, as well. Excuse me. Rob. Oh, thank you, Chair Martin. Um, we're talking about mapping and uh, priorities with central government. We've got major priorities to attend to, in my view, and, and that is three waters and intensification, and the fact that we've been uh, classified as a T1 uh, area, and that is for central Auckland and central Wellington, and it's not appropriate, and um, can we get that down, can we uh, get central government to put that down to T2 at least uh, so we don't have these massive developments forced on us which will be driven by developers and you know the council themselves you know to uh, to build them is, could that be a priority or is this the right um, forum to... oh, look, I don't think this is necessarily the right forum it's, it's right. fine to, vi to find a voice and I would mm. suggest we bring that through a council only meeting to start off with um, because it's a broader uh, conversation, if you like, it's a relevant conversation. I agree. Um, from a social perspective, um, I actually have no idea what a tier one ramification is. I, I've, I've got more of an idea around housing, uh, but I actually have no idea whether well, there's an uh, there'd be something to know. Would be the, uh, for instance, the old Taki railway station because of the location of the railway station, the immediate buildings could, with a T one, be twelve storied. Mm. Uh, which would wreck the place. Uh, so we argue, of course, we've argued that we only have two movements a day in that railway station. Uh, you know, it's the capital connection goes into Wellington mm. and then comes back. So we're not really a real central railway station. That's but Auckland. we want to be. Um. Oh, no, 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 no. My <laughs> point is that we had to argue that we don't want the 12 storey, which would be a no, legal but I'm talking more situation. Connection. And and I think we're down to six storeys now, and that's inappropriate too. We want mm. uh, two or three storey with gaps in between what the space thing. We don't want central government driving the environment up at Old Tech or at Kapiti Coast. And um, I think we've got to fiercely uh, get that classification sorted with central government. My point is, do we have liaison with central government with regard to this mapping and the priorities and all of that? And um, can we get more priority and start getting these things sorted out? Um, three council officers, I would think that um, our work with regards to the introduction of Plan Change 2 and all the associated consultation around that is our current mechanism. Uh, with regards to addressing that, the uh, conversation around the Tier 1 designation, um, I think is a separate conversation uh, to that, but very relevant and one that needs to be um, brought up and discussed quite urgently. With regards to the different de uh, designations of um, townships versus local areas and heights of buildings, there's a certain aspect of that that we won't have any control over, I dare say. There will be something that's pushed through by government and we can try and make as as Nahapu is well aware of with regards to the uh, precinct we have down uh, at the Otaki Township and uh, the work the council officers have done to ensure that's protected as much as possible under the current legislation, which I will say has been forced on us through this tier one designation. So I do think it is something to be addressed. Uh, Rob, so thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Are there any council officers that would like to comment on that? Chris? Morena, um, just to say that uh, at the next um, strategy operations and finance meeting, we will be uh, discussing submissions 
on um, the waters uh, bill and some of the RMA submissions that are coming through, there may be an opportunity for you to think about whether that's an appropriate place to, to provide some commentary around these thoughts once you've had time to have discussion. Uh, Mayor Holborough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I've just had a chat with Democracy Services about potentially um, giving some of those um, submissions um, as early as possible, rather than just with the agenda, so that we can provide feedback um, potentially prior to them being um, attached to the agenda. So, um, a work in progress, but if, if we could have any of those submissions as soon as possible to make sure that they align with what we... We could then almost even have a councillor-only session to discuss whether we agree with our positioning on, on those issues. Just for clarity, what... Um Chris and Councillor Albro are talking about is the submission process that we've just had with regards to district plan change two. That's coming back to the council table shortly. The um, uh, submissions in regards to that um, is what um, Mayor Holbro is referring to. Um, uh, Sorry, I stand corrected. <laughs> is that the submissions on the RMA reform that we're talking about? Our submissions on three waters and um, the intensification. <laughs> just goes to show you the wonders of all the different no, reforms no, that we're talking about. I, I, would, I would say that my comments there would apply to any submissions that we make. I would agree. <laughs> because quite often the time frame means that by the time we get to the meeting, the submission has, is either about to be submitted or has been submitted. Yes. So bearing in mind that time frame, as soon as um, a draft is available, I'm aware that sometimes the, the time, time frame is pretty tight anyway, but as soon as a draft is available, if they could be... Um, stuck in a folder in our hub, that would be great. And my apologies, I stand corrected. I was referring to submissions made by the public onto District Plan Change 2. Um, I think you're referring to a submission that we're putting together. Yeah, sorry, my, my, my mistake. Chris. Um, sorry, if I may. Um, uh, we are going to have an opportunity to work through the draft on the 7th of um, February. So we will be actually circulating out the drafts uh, tomorrow. So um, not not for a long-term um, weekend reading, of course, but um, in advance of that session, uh, <laughs> if you want to. Um, but we'll be looking to, forward to discussing that with you. So there will be an opportunity, and then the proposed final will come back through. So um, even though we are working to tight time frames, so we're really trying to build that in so that you have that opportunity. Appreciate that, Chris. Thank you very much. Kim, I actually had you listed down. Um. Um, yeah, no, it was just a comment on what Councillor Kirby brought up about um, that piece of work and um, and the silos. And sometimes I think we get lost in... Um, and we had this discussion at the end of the last training about how we collect that data because historically we get someone like PwC in, they do a big survey, and, and we collect all this data... But what it doesn't do is it doesn't doesn't actually connect to the people on the ground a lot of the time. It's a bit, um, I don't know, it, it, the way we collect data doesn't seem to get us the real quality data that we need, which we get from connections in this room. Mm -hmm. um, so the connections we have in this room are the ground roach level connections. Um, so if there are ways that we can collect what we have here, on, on, and incorporate that. Um, and there's also the thing of working in silos, how organisations work in silos. And from my perspective, we can, we've become a society where if someone has an idea, they form a committee. So we now have so many committees, so many organisations, all trying to do the same thing. Once upon a time, it was a town hall and everyone went there. Yeah. But we don't do that anymore. You know, kids don't do that. They have their own forums. Um, teenagers have their own forums, different demographic have their own forums which they live in, and it's not the town hall, you know. My, all our kaumātua, you say there's something on at the marae, they'll all rock up, mm. but their kids won't. Um, their kids will talk about it at a sporting event, and their mokos will talk about it at school. Um, so it's the way in which we perceive how we collect that data, and the silos is not just in the organisations, it's in our thinking, we work in silos. If I go back to when we first started coming to this thing, this thing, <laughs> council, <laughs> um, when I first started working for Ngahapu, coming to these things, we worked, we thought in silos because we're so overwhelmed with what we're trying to achieve that we just thought, well, let's just concentrate on us 
and then a year down the track we saw the benefit in actually <laughs> it affects us but it also helps having the perspective of everyone because our perspective is the same so it's our thinking as well as our physical buildings and committees that we have and so it's just a really different way we need to look at a really different way not keep collecting data the traditional way we collect it was kind of all I had to say yeah thank you for that Kim uh, very insightful I do um, I do wonder whether you know you come back to those um, town hall type public forums marae based uh, protocol where you know you can all come and have a bit of a chat whether people are so disenfranchised that they don't see the value in that anymore um, and whether that's something that um, we need to slowly build back a bit as well because it's very easy to get caught up on our digital technology but as we well know face-to-face -face interactions in those spaces can convey so much more information in a short period of time and also avoid misunderstanding um, as well and uh, technology although it can be very beneficial in lots of ways tried and proven techniques as well um, can be very effective too. And that's my profound thought for the day. Please feel free to write that down uh, and any trademarking. Uh, <laughs> um, Chris, did you have anything else to add to that? Fantastic. Could I ask council officers if they finished? Fantastic. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, moving on to James, the floor is yours, so to speak. <laughs> we use the grey hair barometer around here, uh, James, don't we, Nigel? If you're not paying attention, buddy, you're missing out. <laughs> Uh, uh, kia ora, kia ora tātou. Um, Mr Chairman, Your Worship, uh, councillors, our, our elected members and our iwi partners, it's good to be back in front of you again. It's been a while um, and I've certainly felt that. So look, I, what I wanted to do this morning um, is just give you some reassurance uh, given events in Auckland um, and I, I don't want to talk about what's happened up there or what might have worked or what not, that's out of my purview, but I just wanted to give you reassurance that I believe we're, we're in a good position, as good as we can be. So I'm just gonna take you through some thoughts um, and uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions after that because I'm sure you will. Um, you made reference, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to infrastructure. I was hoping that we could have this court error while Sean was still in the room, but he did say to me he's given me a mandate to spend up to $250 million on infrastructure if you need it, if you need it today, but maybe we won't do that. Look, so, so Always looking for a recommendation we can push up the food chain. <laughs> um, so so I, I tried to anticipate what might be front of mind for you and, and starting with the question, how well prepared are we? Um, and in my opinion, we are as prepared as we can be. And that sounds like a bit of a halfway house. And before I get into some of the detail of reassuring you what we do to be as prepared as we can be, I want to remind you, um, and I understand you had a briefing from Jeremy Holmes from Remo as part of your induction. I'm sorry that it was four hours long, um, um, but I understand, that I, I understand it was pretty in depth. Um, so forgive me if I canvass some of that again. But we're dealing with staff um, who have day jobs and whose day jobs are really busy. So when we activate the ERC, they are not trained professionals. It's then unlike police and fens where they, you know, they practice all day, every day. Um, this, this is an add on. And whilst we've got some really committed staff, it is, it is uh, part, part of their, their, their BAU, um, but they don't get a lot of time to practice and practice and practice, um, uh, despite what I'm going to tell you. So we got we got 71 staff um, on the ERC roster, 58 of those sit on what we call the function desks. Um, so that's PIM and uh, under the SIMS model, the coordinated incident management uh, system. Um, and we have some experts in there um, supporting, supporting those staff. 
We, we have tried to set ourselves up to have a three-shift model so that we manage for uh, burnout over a long-run event, um, uh, any burnout and fatigue. Uh, we're able to bring a, a second or a third shift in and keep staff as fresh as we can. We've got five controllers. Um, I'm keen to expand that and get people trained. Uh, one controller is on call 24-7 um, for, for a week at a time. I, I think it's my turn coming up on Friday, and I have looked, I looked, ahead, <laughs> have looked ahead at windy.com to see what's coming, uh, and I'll touch some, some more on that. Um, we're supported, uh, obviously, by Remo regionally, but we have two of their staff here locally, um, and we are extraordinarily well served in the community resilience space by Rene Corlett, um, who is out in community... Uh, all day, every day, um, working with uh, the different um, parties and community in there. So we're well served there. We're well practiced. Um, uh, we have regular storm events here in Kapiti, not of the intensity that Auckland has just experienced. Um, but there was, I understand, before I came here in 2015, a huge storm event uh, that had similar... Uh, um, I think there was 20 to 30 houses evacuated, massive slips around. Um, so so we, we, it's, we're not immune to it. When you look at the region, um, over the last four years, there has been 380% increase in emergency management events. Um, and um, all of the councils, I suspect in the country, but certainly I can speak for in the region, are, are struggling about how we resource, build a capable um, uh, workforce to be able to respond to that, but also have the capacity to respond to that, given the caveat that um, all of the staff have a day job as well. Uh, and you'll remember last year, my, my favourite, the pest from the west. Um, Europe had the beast from the east, but we had a pest from the west last year with the tornadoes, and particularly the impact in uh, Kapiti and Paraparaumu. Um, and so, so we're, we're well practised. Um, a bit like the hurricanes, and I've particularly used the hurricanes as, as the team to pick. Um, we practice regularly. We have two formal exercises under the um, guidance of Remo and NEMA uh, each year. Um, but uh, uh, And those are debriefed and we take action, after action reviews out of those. And um, But the, the desk leads for each of those uh, functions in that SIMS model, uh, their staff get together once a month and uh, just, just practice um, uh, recently, you'll see a press release, I think, from the mayor today um, uh, in November while I was lying up in hospital. Um, our building team were out doing some rapid building assessments just to try and be a bit match fit. And as a result of that, we've been able to send three staff uh, shortly uh, to Auckland uh, to help out with their rapid building assessment. So we're practicing all the time. We also have something called KISEC. I, uh, Kim, I was listening to your Cordero around um, uh, committees. Uh, we have another one, KISEC, the Capital Emergency Services Committee. Um, but that that's uh, police and fire, uh, Electra, AMBO, um, and a few others that, that come to join us. And we meet bi-monthly. And uh, do tabletop exercises so that we get to understand how the different agencies work. So, so practice a plenty, um, and I, th I, th I believe that keeps us reasonably match fit. So, how will we respond in a similar event? And 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 I put the caveat out there: if we have an event like Auckland had, we will have houses uh, flooded, we will have slips. Um, so, all of that practice doesn't stop the rain from falling. And, and it would be good for, for Sean to have been here because he could correct what I understand. I think our current pipes and, and uh, overland flow pass and that can take uh, about 10 to 15 mils an hour. Bear in mind that Auckland had 70 mils an hour and there is currently no systems that will, will cope with that. So we will have flooding. Um, but how will, how will we respond? Well, um, we monitor days out. And as I say, I, I use windy.com. Um, Met service will always issue their, their formal warnings. You usually get about two days heads up, but windy.com I have found to be a reliable source just to give you a bit of an indicator of what's sitting out in either in the, uh, the Northeast Pacific, you know, as, as those tropical storms come down or we get the winds from, from Australia. So you can see that whole Pacific Basin and um, it's proved reasonably reliable. And so we look at that and we push some early comms. Um, in fact, I, I, I regular, uh, regularly have a, um, 
a debate with Sue about whether we're going out too early and the risk, the risk of crying wolf too early. But I think early comms is really good. And as if the event develops and as it gets closer, we increase our comms through the PIM desk. Um, often stand the ERC up, what I call light, uh, which is we, we will have one or two on each desk function, not fully activate, but we'll monitor. Um, and as things develop, um, if, it, if it, it misses us, then we'll stand down. Um, if, if not, then we'll, we'll ramp up. For these types of events, usually we can start to ramp up two, two or three days out. If it's an earthquake, well, of course, you, there's no advance warning. If it's a tsunami, you might be lucky. If it's a distant sort tsunami, you might get 12 hours or, or 24 hours, but we take those leads from NEMA. So um, we, we do have an awesome PIM team, that, that comms team, um, and they very well connected out through social media. Um, Rene, particularly, I'm thinking about the aged care facilities where maybe people don't use social media, but there's good connections into those, um, those facilities. Um, we've got a great ops team. So before, but, you know, before even these things hit us, Tony and his team are out there clearing gutters. We're doing good communication to ask people to take a little bit of responsibility and where they see their own gutters blocked to unclear those. So all, all of that preparation stuff. Um, and then, as I say, we, we increase the frequency of comms uh, as the event gets a bit closer, and then I start to connect with the mayor um, and the CE, and we, we push some comms out through there. Um, uh, that would be the comms channel. So what are the emergency management priorities? And I, and I do look at what's going on in Auckland and, and, um, and, and, and just, just wonder if it's quite as clear. Um, f for me as the controller or whoever's in charge, the key priorities are to develop situational awareness that sort of sims emergency management language. That is to really get a good understanding of what's happening on the ground out there. That's absolutely the top priority, followed alongside that by preserving life, uh, preserving life in community, but preserving our staff's life, not sending staff out into raging floodwaters. We don't have uh, skills and expertise in that, um, and I actually had to... Um, remind one of my staff last year when we had the pest from the west, um, when they went out into a flooded paddock with the best intentions in the world to rescue a cow, and they did that successfully, but quite as easily could have got caught up in a barbed wire fence and um, suffered the consequences. So preservation of life is, is absolutely critical. Coordination of the other agencies, that is the ELC's role. We are not deliverers, and I'll touch on some of the things we don't do. Um, our, our job is one of coordination. Plan preparation um, as the, the event develops and um, a particular focus in, in a flood type event of provision of uh, coordination of provision of welfare response. Um, what, so who, who will do what? Uh, CDM obviously that emergency management is the coordination. Fans do life and property. We, we are not interested, it's as brutal as it sounds, uh, Protection of property is not one of my priorities as the, as the controller. That is Fens's job. Police will do law and order and, and, and road stuff, road safety and uh, those sorts of things. MSD are the primary agency for food and welfare. And MB and Kainga Ora are for the provision of um, uh, accommodation. Um, not, notwithstanding, we will have community hubs that will respond, respond immediately to um, uh, people that have to evacuate until such times as we get that coordination with those other agencies. What is your role? And I think Jeremy will have talked to you about your role as elected members, and it is that public messaging, the approved messaging that's coming out of the ERC, just repeating that out in community, and, um, and also being an intel source for us, and feeding that information back in through the approved channel, and, and depending on the nature of the event, we will actually have a, an elected member representative in um, the ERC to be that conduit uh, for us, uh, for, for information coming back from the ground. Um, again, my, my thoughts are, will, will, if we have an event like Auckland, will we have um, the impact, similar impacts, I, I think we will. Um, I, I do believe we're well prepared and we push early comms. We can head some of that stuff off. We have, through COVID, had a, uh, developed a wonderful relationship with the iwi organisations who are superbly placed, uh, placed to help out in this space and really 
pay dividends through through COVID, um, and so we're looking to grow those relationships. Um, in answer to my initial question, are we prepared? I believe we are. The thing I'd ask you to do in community is challenge your constituents, are they prepared? Please use the Auckland experience to encourage people to go to the website, look at the plans and the guidance around personal preparedness, household preparedness. Um, you'll see in the resident satisfaction results that our number, I think we have a, um, a percentage of 70% of those surveyed, we would like to uh, know that, uh, have a personal preparedness plan. That has dropped a bit at 62%. We expect that. And then people will get really interested again when we have a big shake. Let's let's not wait to that to get get those numbers up. So look, that, that's my quarter. I hope I hope, and I'm more than happy to take questions. I hope you have some sense that um, uh, we'll we'll be as okay as we can be when the next event happens. Thank you. Um, me Yeah. Th thank you very much for that, James. I think that's all really important information. Um, once we have this meeting up online, um, maybe we could share the link with other um, elected members who aren't here to encourage them with a time code for this bit of the meeting. I'm sure idea. they'll enjoy watching the whole meeting because it's been really wonderful, but and with a time code for this part because I think that's really important and then we won't have to repeat um, those, those messages. Uh, Got that, Nigel? For the rest of the group. Got that. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, so in terms of encouraging our community to be prepared, um, in terms of neighbours supporting each other, um, maybe we could have a little um, separate discussion about that sometime in terms of the work that we're doing. I know Over the Fence Cuppa is coming up. Yep. What can we do as elected members to encourage people mm. to make the most of that? I think there's a real opportunity there in the wake of Auckland to say, hey, this is really important that you get together and, and do something, and this is a way that you can do it and get a gift pack from council. Um, I think uh, reminding us of our role is really important. I heard one of the councillors in Auckland being uh, congratulated on national radio for directing traffic. And I know I've been sprung directing traffic as an elected member before in the past. And yeah, that message of keeping, keeping yourself safe and, and doing what's within our role. At the same time, it's, it's, you know, it's tempting to help. <laughs> you know, the cow is a really great, a really great example of that kind of almost um, like a metaphor, isn't it? So, yeah, thank you so much, James, and thank you um, for the work that you and the team do. It's hugely appreciated. It's an extra responsibility that people voluntarily take on as staff members of our organisation, and it's hugely important and hugely appreciated. So, um, And I'm sure, as you say, we're as prepared as we can be. And I'll do talk about um, uh, Mia Hobbera's um, thoughts. Everything I've seen in the last triennium is certainly geared towards professionalism and um, and the preparedness of our EOC uh, to respond to emergency. I think we're very, very lucky and very well positioned in that space. Thank you, James. I have one question, funnily enough. Um, one of the things that um, came to the fore through a lot of those sort of floods was the impact on slash or the forestry um, excess, if you like, coming down the rivers um, as such. And I know that we can certainly see it very live, uh, the uh, logging that's just going on here, but I know there's a lot of logging going over the backs as well. And I have heard a whisper that uh, potentially there's issues even at the top of the Waikanae River with regards to um, a potential disaster unfolding if we got those sorts of um, rain volumes, perhaps not even those sorts of rain volumes, just serious rain volumes. Um, I do, and I appreciate that this is a regional council um, issue um, with regards to that, but I do wonder whether this has been a situation that's been out of mind, so sorry, out of sight, so out of mind for quite a long period of time, and um, whether it's prudent that we perhaps step up a little bit in, um, in ensuring that um, our contractors in those spaces are making their obligations and that we don't um, get the uh, unintended consequence um, of their um, not meeting their... Uh, conditions of the um, consensus stuff as such. Your thoughts on that? Uh, look, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I, you know, heartbreaking to see what what Gisborne and the, and, and the coast have, have had over the last number of years. Um, and, and I think, 
you're right to an extent. Uh, it is at kind of out of sight, out of mind. I will pick that up as a piece of work and ask our um, uh, senior advisor, emergency management, to have a look. I believe there are mechanisms available to councils. And I'll speak in that general sense. Um, if there's nothing in a resource consent, if it's a permitted activity in the district plan, uh, and there's nothing in the district plan, we still have the overarching um, uh, objectives of the RMA around not causing that environmental nuisance. There must be a way that we can exercise leverage, if if needed, on on logging companies. Um, uh, but but you're right, it could happen here. So uh, so thank you for reminding me of that, and um, I'll pick that up as an action. Uh, Chairman, also the key to comment. Uh, can I suggest that's Hopper? followed up through the Climate and Environment Committee, maybe? Definitely. Mm -hmm. No one else? Thank you very much, James. Much appreciated of the update. So we move to point eight, uh, which is public confirmation of public excluded minutes, which I am sure that we don't have. <laughs> Uh, and that moves us to a closing karakia, um, which I've taken the liberty of sourcing. I hope it's appropriate, uh, and I hope the pronunciation is not too bad. Um, this uh, traditional karakia, um, Fakataka Tihau, is Fakataka Tihau ki ti uru, Fakataka Tihau ki ti tonga, Kai ma kinakina ki uta, Kai. He aki ana ti atakura, he toi, he huku, huka, he hauhu, tihi Māori ora. Cease the winds of the west, cease the winds of the south, let bracing breezes flow over the land, let bracing breezes flow over the sea. Let the red tipped dawn come with sharpened air, a touch of frost, and the promise of a glorious day. Let us celebrate life. And with that, we close the meeting. Thank you very much for your attendance and uh, some, some very, very interesting conversations, uh, which I'm sure was going to lead to some very good outcomes for our community. Thank you very much.